I'd like you to turn to the book of Luke 21, verse 25. I'll read this whole passage, about 11 verses. There should be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things began to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. And then go down to verse 34. Take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that should come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. This uh, passage of the words of Jesus, so relevant, you know, and yet there's um, tension in it because he says on the one hand, these things that are coming on the earth are absolutely going to give uh, people perplexity, which means we don't know what to do anymore. You know, all the experts and all the masters and all the leaders and all. And so on the one hand, men's hearts are failing for, uh, for, for fear. And he said that um, there be celestial signs and on the earth, distress of nations, perplexity. And then he makes this comment, the sea and the waves roaring. But the sea and the waves are a metaphor for all the, the Gentile peoples of the world, the nations. Uh, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And he says, men's hearts will literally fail them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. I mean, people that are, people that think is what he's talking about. People that look at what's happening. Many of them, their hearts will fail for fear. They will lose heart and they will absolutely collapse for fear of the things, because he says the very powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And the powers of the heavens, I mean, it talks about even the he heavenly realm above the nations uh, shall be shaken. And uh, that's what he describes. But then in, in verse 34, there's tension there, because he said, Take heed to yourself, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And you see how they don't seem to go together. All these things distressing uh, the world, the, power, the very powers of the heavens shaken, massive earth-shattering things happening on the earth. But on the other hand, he says, hey, don't get too caught up in the world and don't be overcharged with overindulging. Surfeiting doesn't just mean food or drink. It means anything, you know. And make sure that you uh, don't get overcome by the cares of this life. So on the one hand, it's like earth-shattering events. On the other hand, it's like, hey, business as usual. Don't, don't let that dull your edge. Okay. And because uh, he says the day that comes, you don't want the day to come unaware. There's a day coming that he says is going to come like a snare trap on all those who dwell on the earth. And you don't want that day to come on you unaware. You see what I'm saying? There's a tension there. How could it be so shattering, earth-shaking events that people that think about it, they're losing heart. They don't even know the answer. Nations raging like the ocean. And the other, time, the other warning for the same time, don't be too caught up in this world and don't be too worldly and don't let the cares of this life day in, day out, marrying, giving in marriage. You know, how, do you, how do you reconcile these? And yet... I see now. I see because we're living it. Earth-shattering things are happening every single day. And people are going, man, I hope the Hawkeyes are good this year. Or the Cyclones. Or got your Christmas shopping done. You see, it's exactly what Jesus said. On the one hand, if you're a thinking person, if you look at this earth. But most people don't. And they don't think, and even worse, they don't really think biblically. So these earth-shattering events happen right before their eyes, and they have no idea that anything's going on. 
So it is just what Jesus said. Don't let the day come like a snare. Now, one of those earth-shattering things that's happening right before our eyes is what I believe that I want to give a brief explanation for. And I hope that somehow or other this gets on YouTube and we can really help other people. See, right before our eyes, people oblivious to it, too many people, but not biblically minded people. They, they're a little bit more aware and then prophetically minded people even more aware. And that is the true meaning of this European refugee crisis. This is the biggest refugee crisis since World War II. Millions of people displaced. And we see crowds streaming into Europe from several different points. People crowding on boats in North Africa and landing on the shores of Italy. Well, North Africa is only 100 miles from Italy. Spain's only 11 miles from Africa. People are dumping boats off because the European Union has a policy that if a refugee comes, we, we got to set them up and get them, you know, get them taken care of. And we got generous welfare benefits and things like that. So what you have is not thousands, but millions of people all of a sudden washing ashore in Italy, Spain, Greece, pushing past border posts in Hungary, thronging into, into, uh, into Europe. This is a tragedy on a major scale, but there are reasons for it, and there is a scriptural uh, message in it. There's, this is of a, a great prophetic significance. I want to try to explain it. First of all, a lot mo the, the reason given for this refugee surge is the, um, is the Syrian civil war. Now, let, let me just try to be brief. The Syrian civil war is an outcome of Obama's foreign policy with the Muslim world. Before uh, the post-World War II Muslim world, they were on the wrong side in World War I and World War II. They helped the Germans. So the West set up this, this situation. We made countries, just we drew lines on maps. Says, here you go, that's Algeria, that's Morocco, that's, that's Libya. We just made up these countries and we established it so that there was some kind of order there. And the leaders of these countries, although you and I wouldn't want to live under them uh, because they were pretty harsh, but they weren't necessarily Muslim. They were secular pragmatic people. Along comes something called the Arab Spring. This is why I wrote my book, so if you want more detail on it, get my book. I saw it on the land. Basically, the meaning of the Arab Spring is that the West, Britain, France, America, the European Union, undermined these secular leaders for some reason and took the rug out from underneath people like Mubarak, even the Shah of Iran, uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, people that were secular, people that were brutal indeed. I wouldn't want to live under any of them, but they were nothing compared to the people that followed, which is radical Islam. Okay. Syria is no different. Bashar Assad is a terrible man. I couldn't stand his father, Hafez. He was a brutal dictator, but he knew what you had to do to hold back the forces that have now been released. It's like you take a bottle of champagne and shake it 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 and, shake it, and then pop the cork and boom out rushes forces long held back. And the thing about it is you'll never get it back in the bottle. And as I explain in my book, um, the reason for this, there's all kinds of human reasons ineptitude, misguided foreign policy, anti-Western views of Obama, but spiritual reasons. God said there'd be a certain setup in the Middle East when Jesus come back and it would be hostile to Israel and it would be a siege against Israel and there would be tremendous hostility. Well, Egypt had a 30-year peace treaty with Israel, okay? So that, could, that wasn't going to do it. Those f people have been removed, and for the most part, there's still a lot of fighting going on. They can't get rid of Hafez Assad. They, they got rid of Mubarak when he was replaced by a terrible man uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood. And then Egypt had its own civil war and put in 
one of their gen better. But, you know, that's right out of the Bible, Isaiah 19. This just explains exactly what happened in Egypt. That's not my purpose today. But now, let me get more specific, though. Why the Civil War and why these millions of people, okay? And the main reason is because um, the, within Islam, one out of seven people in the world are Muslim. But mo Islam is not monolithic, thank God. Islam has a strict and sharp divide. Eighty percent of Muslims are of a variety called Sunni. Sunni. And that's the Arabs, basically. Saudi Arabia and the near neighbors of Israel. Eighty percent of Islam is of a denomination called Sunni. And twenty percent, basically, is a denomination called Shiite. You know how Muslims hate Jews and they hate Christians. and I, They hate each other so much worse than even they hate the Jews. It's hard for us to comprehend, okay? What you have there in Syria, the way the Allies divided the world is they would take the weak tribes and put them in charge. Now, why'd they do that? Because then those people were insecure and they would have to really suppress their populations just to keep power. Hafez Assad and his son, his son Bashir in Syria um, really were brutal because they were part of even a, a tinier minority, Alawite Shiites. That's a sect within Shiism. Very small minority. And it's the Sunni majority. So once this Arab Spring started, a civil war broke out to try to throw off the yoke of Bashir Assad. And this is what you've got going in Syria. Now, it's also a proxy war because the West, Europe, and even the United States basically supports the Sunnis. And we armed rebels to try to fight Hafez Assad but we can't oust him because he's a client of the Russians and Iran. Iran is a Shiite country, okay? And the Russians are big time supporters. So what happened is we heavily trained and heavily armed various Sunni militias and totally equipped them with the most modern weaponry. And that became ISIS. ISIS. Are you following me? ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, which that's a more important name. That's the only name Obama will give them, ISIL. Why? It's Sunni. They're Sunni. Yeah, they're Sunni. And the, the reason Levant's important is because the Levant includes Israel. So they're saying that's ours, all right, and so does Obama. He says that's theirs too. Okay. Now, the Sunni is ISIS, the Sunni. And the Saudis are Sunni, and the Kuwaitis are Sunni, and Bahrain Sunni, and Abu Dhabi Sunni, and um, uh, much of Lebanon Sunni, and the, much of Syria Sunni. Uh, but the Shiites um, are very powerful and very fierce. And you got this war between Hezbollah, which is the Shiite militia that took over southern Lebanon and was, was fostered in Syria. And, and um, ISIS, and I mean, this war is so brutal, there is no good side. See, that's the thing. When these refugees stream to get out of this war, you think, now, who are the good ones and who are the bad ones? There is no good side. The atrocities are unbelievable. I won't go into it because um, uh, I don't want to, you know, sensationalize anything. But unspeakable terrors and horrors have occurred in this war, in which 250,000 Syrians have been killed, a quarter of a million killed in a civil war. Now, I, now what Obama did is, you know, for political reasons, he made a quick exit from Iraq. We actually won a war in Iraq, unseated a leader. I don't believe in nation building or anything, but the way he left, he, they hastily trained the Iraqis who the Iraqis is an interesting country because it was a Sunni, a Shiite majority, but the Sunnis ran it. Shiites hate the Sunnis. Okay, and so the, the, when, when we, when we so-called liberated Iraq and turned it over, they elected a Shiite. And he wouldn't uh, 
give any benefits at all to the Sunnis. So they joined up with ISIS and we left a billion dollars of our best military equipment there. And that's why when you read about um, when ISIS would go on the march, so these people would just collapse and get out of their uniforms, drop their weapons. Well, part of that is cowardice and part of that is sympathy because they're Sunnis. So they're not going to fight their Sunni brothers. It's confusing, isn't it? So then the first thing they did is took the city of Mosul. This has everything to do with the Bible, too. Mosul is the modern name. You know what the ancient name is? Anyone? Nineveh. Nineveh. That's right. The ISIS took the city where Nineveh was, and the first thing they did is blew up Jonah's tomb. Okay, because they're... They believe that anything formed is idolatrous. So they blew up Jonah's tomb. You know what they found when they got, blew up the mosque over Jonah's tomb? A fourth century church. <laughs> We're everywhere. Anyway, they went, uh, they robbed the banks in, you couldn't make this up, could you? They robbed the banks in Mosul, and they didn't just become the richest terror organization in the world. They instantly became one of the richest organizations in the world because that's a heavy oil area, and there was gold there in that bank, the gold of the nation. They could buy anything. Now, they had this civil war, and they've taken this territory the size of Indiana. It's basically the same territory in the biblical ancient Assyria. Not Syria, but Assyria. And, uh, for some reason, I mean, the, 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 the resistance to them, I mean, this is, a, this is the who's who of the Bible. The great resistance to them is the Kurds, which it biblically were called the Medes. The Kurds, 50 million people, they don't have a state. Everyone around there hates and fears them because they know these, the stateless people want to have a state. And part of their state would be part of Turkey and part of Iraq and part of Syria. And so they all hate the Kurds, but the Kurds are the most pro-American people. They're Muslim, but pro-American. They are the only people that would defend Middle Eastern Christians there. Okay. And they, uh, we, will, we will not, the Obama will not arm the, the Kurds. He will not give them the weapons to fight ISIS. Now there's another aspect of this that I think is important is that what they want is to restore something called the caliphate. The caliphate is their dream. And you hear the expression caliphate. Well, what was the caliphate? The caliphate, ever since Islam, the Sunnis have had something called the caliphate until 1922. The caliphate was the unifying governing authority of the Sunni people. As long as there was a caliphate, which is a kingdom with a caliph, then all Sunnis are enjoined to go to war against the infidels. Now, in 1922, Turkey became secular. They, they just suppressed Islam. They never left it, but they suppressed it. Became a secular nation and shut down the caliphate. And this really grieved the Sunnis. And they have longed for that caliphate to be restored. And ISIS is making the claim that they're restoring the caliphate. And so um, this is the crazy thing. Oh, and the one other thing, too, is that uh, Western powers, we helped, unfortunately. We, blood's on our hands. But uh, Britain and France especially took out uh, Gaddafi of Libya in North Africa. They, they killed him. It, it was terrible the way he was killed. The West pulled the rug out from underneath him, armed their bitter enemies. Those bitter enemies repaid us by killing our ambassador. And, but see, the thing about the consequences, they left chaos there in Libya. Gaddafi kept a lot of those people from coming north into Africa and up onto Europe. Okay. They couldn't get by him. He had a, basically a, a well-run country, really, in spite of his own savagery. But he kept them. So when we took them out, see, the Bible says the wicked digs a pit, then he falls into it. Okay. Europeans destroyed Gaddafi. And now millions of Africans are pouring up into Europe. It's not all Syrians. Africans. Refugees in the millions. First they went into Jordan. Then they went into Lebanon. And they went into Turkey in the millions. Jordan is a tiny little country. They got two million refugees. 
from Syria. I'd want to get out. You'd want to get out. That war is so savage, okay? But then uh, the Western world began to feel the heat. The U UN has something called uh, Commission on Refugees. Okay, and guess uh, who runs it? The Muslim countries. And they'll assign refugees to the countries of the world. Let's say, U.S., you're going to take 60,000 this year, and so and so and so and so on. So they've been dealing these refugees, Muslims, all over the world. Now, Europe got very aggressive, especially Germany, the most powerful country in Europe, and probably the dynamo of the European Union. Because Angela Merkel, president of Germany, said, we will take 800,000 of these refugees within the next year. Now think with me. Germany is a nation of 80 million people. So 800,000 is 1% of your whole population. Germany already has a lot of Turks and a lot of Arabs. They have a Muslim problem. They have people in Dresden, 40,000 people turned out to protest and quit with the Islamic immigration. Why? Because it's disruptive. It's not racist. Islam isn't a race anyway. Islam's an ideology. So it's not racist to say Islam brings problems. God himself said that uh, Ishmael shall always be at war with everybody and with himself. Islam is the, is the uh, custodian of Ishmael's grievance and Esau's. He said, literally, the angel of the Lord prophesied and over him at his birth, he shall be a wild ass of a man. His hand will be against everybody and everybody's hand will be against him. So you got a civilized country or a civilized area like Europe, which is a very beautiful and orderly place. And you already have problems because of Islam. And then the, she says, I'll take 800,000, 1% of the population, okay? Don't, it doesn't have to be a, minor, a majority to be a real problem, okay? So, in swarm these refugees. Now, France says, I'll take 20,000. Britain is very moderate, we'll take 10,000. Germany, I'll take 800,000. Uh, Poland says, we won't take one. The only refugees we'll take from that area are Christians. And they said, because they wouldn't fit in with us. Now, the whole world's condemning Poland. <laughs> They're making sense. We're not, they said, we're a Christian country. We're not Islamic. So does Slovakia. They said, we will take any Christian refugees, but we won't take one Muslim. We don't have enough mosques, they said. Okay. Czech, the Czech Republic, same thing. Eastern Europe. Hungary, that's because they live closer to the border of the Muslim world. They have a history with, the, with Islam. And they know, man, it's nothing but trouble. But Germany is going to be better than everyone, so they'll take 800,000, okay? So in poor the people, that's what you've been seeing in the news. And look, many of these people are, uh, uh, you see pictures of women and children and babies and mothers. And, and this is powerful stuff because... Whatever you say about the West, I mean, it's long so since uh, abandoned Christ, but Christianity still affects us. We still have a conscience. We're not going to see a baby lying face down on a beach and say, well, that's their problem. People are saying, you've got to do something to our governments. Even our government is saying, we've got to do more. We've got to bring in more, all right? The problem is that a, a lot of it is uh, propaganda, even the baby laying on his face. Like so much else, it's, it's all lies. It's propaganda. The fact of women crying, yes, there are some women, but overwhelmingly, eyewitnesses are coming back saying, there are no women in these vast crowds. These are young, military-aged men. Hmm. And they're not your normal refugee, poverless and pen, penny, penniless and poverty-stricken. They have cell phones, and when you give them food, they throw it back at you. Why? because they gave them Red Cross packages and the package had a cross on it, so they got insulted and threw it right back at them. Military-aged men pouring in. They haven't even waited to do their looting, robbing, violence, menacing people. 
uh, what they're finding is, number one, a lot of these people aren't even from Syria. Uh, they caught one guy and he had a case. They opened up the case. It was all fake Syrian passports. He's selling them to Pakistanis and Beng Bangladeshis. The people from all over black Africa. I don't blame them for wanting to get there. They set them up in camps in Italy. They go, we don't want Italy. We want Germany. You know why? That's got the best welfare benefits in any country in the world. This is what's going on, humanly speaking. Uh, one thing, though, that many people aren't connecting the dots on is that back in February of 2015, it wasn't that long ago, people need to have a memory, the caliph of the ISIS, al-Baghdadi, made an announcement. The way we're going to attack Europe is we're going to fill boats with Muslim re re refugees and just overwhelm them. This is documented. Okay. We'll just overwhelm them. Because they'll, they'll be compassionate. They, they literally said, we put them in leaky ships because they'll go out and rescue them. And you see the Greek Navy, the Italian Navy, they're all out there rescuing these people. Okay. Uh, that's what, how they were going to swamp Europe with refugees. And that's what's happening. But they're all, uh, most of our young men of military age, and they're belligerent and already looting and intimidating. Now, I could give you a list of countries that are taking these refugees in. And, and the funny thing is, okay, Germany, 800,000, America, 60,000, France, 20,000, Britain, 10,000. Well, how about their Muslim brothers, their Sunni brothers? Saudi Arabia, zero. Oman, zero. Abu Dhabi, zero. Qatar, zero. Oil-rich nations and the same religion, and they are adamant, zero. Won't take one in. Why not? Two reasons. They give. This is what they give. The Saudi prince says, that accepting large number of Syrians is a threat to our safety as terrorists will be hiding within an influx of people. Yeah. <laughs> Who would know better than them? They're the ones that financed them. <laughs> the gall. No, we wouldn't do it. It's not safe. You do it. <laughs> Number two. Because of the hijra. You know what the Hijra is, don't you? Oh, okay. Well, the Hijra comes from Islamic history. See, if you really study the, the life of Muhammad, he was nobody. He married a very wealthy merchant lady, Khadijah. He was God conscious, though. He went to a cave and went and prayed and fasted, and he had an epileptic fit and saw an angel. His wife says, you are demon-possessed. He says, I think I am. But then eventually they thought, well, maybe that wasn't the devil. Maybe that was God. So he went back up again and met the angel. And the angel told him about the Quran. Okay. And Muhammad uh, would preach this stuff, and people would laugh at him all over. Uh, Medina was the town he lived in. And eventually his preaching infuriated the people that they persecuted him so he migrated to a Jewish uh, center in Saudi Arabia it wasn't Saudi Arabia by the way it was just Arabia called Yathrib and guess what they felt sorry for him and they took him and he had about 50 followers of course you come live with us and they basically they literally fed him and housed him and let him set up and he started to gather a few more followers, and as soon as he got strong enough, he slaughtered them. <laughs> Immigration. The hijra. It's a doctrine in Islam. If you're weak, weaker than the infidels, just bide your time. In fact, migrate. It's your duty. Don't move to an infidel country. As soon as we get enough power, we'll do what Muhammad did. It's called the Hijra. And guess what? One of those Saudi princes actually let it out. Why would we take them in? We're Islamic. We want to spread the light of Islam to them. It's the Hijra. Until, uh, so the Islamic doctrine of immigration, whereby societies are overwhelmed with Muslims, such 
that Muslims become the dominant voice, force. It's immigration jihad, okay? <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? Now there's one other aspect of this that I, I want to um, talk about, and that is that, um, that the, uh, in this Syrian civil war and throughout the Middle East, and the Arab world, there are, or were, a lot of Christians. A lot of people don't realize, there's, there's churches that date back to the apostles. There's communities of Christians, and whatever you think of them, because they're not Christians as we know it, I mean, if you went into one of their buildings, the walls are covered with pictures and everything like that, but I mean, through every single pressure possible since the sixth century, they would not assimilate with Islam. And the pressure is ungodly, okay? But they just kept their Christian identity. They paid the price to be, uh, they call them uh, you know, Chaldean Christians in Iraq and Marianite Christians in Lebanon. And, you know, it's, it's all kinds of Christians, okay? And w what's happened, though, is that the, the um, ISIS and everything, they're slaughtering Christians. So Christians are applying to come to the West. But here is the weird thing, especially since the Obama administration. It's very hard to get in here if you're a Christian, okay? State Department won't recognize you if you're a Christian, okay? There's, there are Christians that have gotten in. Here's from an article on Front Page Magazine. Christian refugees not even allowed in. Disturbing pattern that we've seen from the State Department of ignoring the particular car targeting of Christians by ISIS while giving preferential treatment for asylum to other groups like Somalis, Iraqis, Syrians, some of whom could very well be members of jihadist movements. There's an article, after four months, why are 20 quality Iraqi Christians who fled ISIS still detained by immigration officials? They've been here for four months. They have family in San Diego saying we will take them, release them. Obama administration won't let them go. See, I, I, here, here's a really bad thing and you've got to pray for our nation. You could almost say that our nation has not only ignored Christians, but we've actually facilitated the persecution of Christians. We are in big, big trouble. We have actually facilitated the persecution of Christians. Here's Faith McDonald, Director of Religious Liberty at the Institution on Religion and Democracy. She told the Christian Post the detainment of these uh, Chaldean Christians is a disturbing pattern by the State Department. Okay. Uh, this follows the disturbing pattern we've seen for the State Department, ignoring the particular target. Oh, I just read that. Okay. Um, U.S. and West victimized Christians fleeing ISIS. He says, according to a recent NPR report, NPR, I mean, they're not Christian. Okay. The U.S. supported moderate coalition fighting, fighting both Bashar and Assad and the Islamic State in Syria. In Syria has extremists in its own ranks who have mistreated Christians, forced them out of their homes. One ship coming up from Africa with uh, 90 African refugees. So they didn't come from the war, they just want a better life. A storm hit. So everyone prayed. 70 Muslims prayed to Allah. 20 Christians began to pray to Jesus Christ. And the Muslims threw the Christians over the board the ship and they drowned. Okay. You get people put in these refugee centers to process them. Stories are coming out. The Muslims persecute the Christians there. Okay. <laughs> See, one guy says, these countries aren't just bringing in refugees from a civil war. They're bringing in a civil war upon themselves. I don't know if you've been reading the gripping accounts of the island of Lesbos, okay, in Greece. Kind of like a Reno or a Las Vegas, but a resort place, but a landing place for Muslims. The, Iraq, the uh, Afghanistan Muslims are fighting the Syrian Muslims. They looted the butcher shop and took every knife and saw and sword. <laughs> and people are going, help! <laughs> everywhere. 
Now, I'm not here to just, you know, sadden you. Like Jesus said, when you see these things start to happen, lift up your head. Your redemption draws nigh. Now, I'm, I'm proud of um, countries like Poland. It's, uh, it says that uh, they will only accept Christians. Okay. I wish our country was like that. If we had a real president, it would be. Certainly not the will of the people. And these people are going to pay. Now, let me get to the word, though, because I told you that this is biblical, and I haven't quoted a, a scripture other than Luke yet. Okay. So, first of all, I want you to look back at the scripture of Luke again. And he says that, uh, let's see, Luke 21, verse 10. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Okay, now, the word nation is the Greek word ethnos. So he's not talking about political entities there. He's talking about different people groups. Okay. Look, think about it. Why did God divide the nations? Well, God divided the nations because the fall has so perverted us that people groups with different languages and religions can't get along. Okay. That's just true. The new makers and shakers of the new world order they can't change that. Although they like that fantasy. Like to teach the world to sing perfect harmony. Just give them a Coke. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Paul said he divided the nation so the people could seek God. See, uh, if you don't have to watch your back all the time because there's a constant civil war going, then maybe you have time to seek God. But you throw people of a different religion. That's exactly right. Different See, <laughs> well, the Constitution wasn't made for anything but a Christian people. It doesn't work. It's now it's a suicide pact. It's being used against us. Okay. And a lot of it's because our leaders, our leaders are so far removed from us. See, this is part of what God showed me about this, why this is happening. The Bible literally says that why do the heathen rage? Why is there such an uproar in the world? And by the way, with this influx of Muslims into Europe, Europe's already in an uproar. They already have terrorism. What do you think they're going to have with one out of 80 people now is Muslim on top of the Muslims already there that they were already demonstrating about because they are so violent and unruly and unproductive. Seriously, they go in, they get one wife, and they put her on the dole. Then they go back to wherever, and they bring back another wife and put her in a different house on the dole, all at the taxpayer's expense. Okay. And then four wives later, these massive socialistic countries wonder why they're going broke. Why well, you can't do that? You can't do that. Why do the heathen rage that people imagine the vain thing? It's a vain imagination, this new world that they're trying to build. There are many vain imaginations, but the great vain imagination that he speaks of is this brand new godless world that they're trying to construct. Multicultural, multi-faith. Only multi-faith is actually no faith. And they're just trying to build it, and it's doomed like the Tower of Babel that it was patterned after. It's the kings of the earth and their rulers. Never, ever forget what the second psalm says about our leaders. The kings of the earth and their rulers is a technical term. It's not just talking about political people, although it includes them. It's all the ruling elite. It's the heads in science, the heads in education, the heads in law, the heads in religion even, the heads in government, the heads in entertainment, news, media, the opinion shakers, Mulder, publishing. All of them have this incredible consensus. They all come to the same conclusion that's anti-God and anti-Christ. That's not Bill Randall saying that. The second psalm warned that. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine the vain thing? Oh, because the kings of the earth and their rulers 
have actually taken counsel together against the Lord and his Christ. So it's not just God in general. Christ. It's Antichrist. Now why would you take a civilized, productive nation like Germany and just open the floodgates and bring in people who before they even get there, they were looting their way in. They can't even control themselves. They're savage. Why would you do that? Well, it has to do with the kings of the earth and the rulers again. See, like I said, as far removed as the nations of the so-called Judeo-Christian world are from the original faith, and we always lament that, don't we? But there's still a lot of it that needs to be wiped out yet. It just needs to be eradicated. In other words, what I'm saying is, you know, Obama lied when he went to Egypt. He told the Muslim world, America's not Christian. Not a lot of Christians said, you know, Obama's right, we're not Christian. No, you, of course we're Christian. Yes, we're backslidden. Yes, our elites are absolutely godless. Yes, a lot of very perverted people are there. But it's Christianity that's the most common consensus. The Muslims know that. That's why they send leaky boats full of Muslims, knowing that the Christian world will go out and salvage them and take care of them. Hey, Saudi, you going to take care of your Sunni brothers? Not one! <laughs> no way! We're afraid of them. Well, if you're afraid of them, why are you wishing them on me? Look, they want to wipe out everything Christian. It says, their counsel is, let us cast aside the cords and the bondages of the Lord and his Christ. Just think of recent history. The cords? Yeah, like marriage. That narrow definition, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his one wife, and they shall be one flesh. And the kings and leaders say, throw that out. Never forget, there has never been a national referendum on it because it wouldn't happen. These things were imposed on us by the elites, the kings of the earth and their rulers. They are fighting the Lord and his Christ. Let me show you a verse in Revelation 19. Then I'll show you one more verse after this I'll be done. This is what's happening. Still too much Christianity. Still some kind of memory. Still groups of people being born again. Still freedom of religion, freedom of thought. Still people that speak for themselves and they're not very easy to lead by the demagogues. Still thinking people and reading people. So they've got to smash them. And the way they'll do it is bring in unruly people that keep you so busy just trying to keep your back. You won't have time to seek God. These people are evil. Now already, now I can't tell you one Republican candidate that is even thinking about this issue of Islamic immigration. In fact, they're all, everyone that I've heard so far is saying, no, yeah, we've got to do more about Syria. Okay, you bring in 10,000 people from a war zone, and then you wonder, you don't wonder why there's so many men here. <laughs> no women. Uh, yeah, it's the hijra, the immigration. Revelation 19, verse 11, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. Now this is going to happen soon. Soon everybody's going to see this. I'm telling you their knees are going to knock. Even people who love him, their knees might be knocking for the glory and majesty of his power. He says, I saw heaven open, behold a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes are as a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses. 
clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth gave it, goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and treads the, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has, a na he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But now look at verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. There they are. Who are they with? Whose side are they on? Who are they coming out to oppose? Their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. You mean in the end, they're going to make war on Jesus? Oh, not in the end. That's what they've been doing all along. In the end, it just becomes obvious. And one more thing. Daniel had a vision of the future that went all the way to the end. You know the statue? Now, the head was gold. That was Babylon. That's the Gentile power ruling over God's people. He said, the people of God are going to be ruled over by Gentiles until a certain point. And then the, the shoulders were of, of uh, silver, and that's the Greeks, and then the, the loins were of bronze, and that's the, the, oh, the Greeks. Uh, the, the, the silver was the Persians, Iranians, Persians, and then the loins were of bronze. But then the legs is the most detailed one. Two legs. And they were of iron. They were very powerful. And it's two legs because the Rome, Rome had two divisions, east and west. Rome, Constantinople. And there are many, many stages to that. The legs go all the way down. It's the western power. And to this day, I mean, Israel is very much beholden, even to the U.S., because we're the extension of that power. And Europe... And at the end, though, he says it's iron mixed with clay. Now, one theory that I have about this influx, see, it says they don't mix. They can't mix. By the way, a word for mixture is Arab in Hebrew. They can't mix. It weakens them. See, any European country because of Western military doctrine and weaponry, if they really had the will, could take out any Middle Eastern country or any other third world country. France, formal. It's that, that they don't have the will. They got the power. Isn't it ironic? Muslims have the will to take us out. Thank you, God, they don't have the power. We got the power, we just don't have the will. In the end, you know, See, because I believe the Antichrist is coming out of Europe. And the last stage of Europe, could this be the beginning of the time of the feet? The iron mixed with clay. You want to weaken a nation? You want to take out the strength? This is a don't mix. Just bring in a bunch of people from a radical religion like Islam. and Just turn them loose. Put them on the dole. Let them do their thing. God, it's so weak. Such a weakening influence. But out of it comes the Antichrist in his kingdom. The end. I think we're at the end. I think we're so close to the coming of Jesus. All I can say is get ready and get, tell other people to get ready. Jesus is coming. Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, use this message to talk to anyone, whether here or on the internet or wherever to give your people an understanding of what's going on. Like you said in the Bible, the men of Issachar, they knew the times and they knew what to do. Father, as people anticipate football season or Christmas or whatever other distraction, huge events are happening. Massive things are being put into place. 
The end is coming. The end of all things is at hand. The Lord is coming to judge the world in righteousness. Let us be like Daniel and interpret the handwriting on the wall for our generation. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.